Today on Cook's Country, Julia and Bridget make a Lone Star State favorite, flank steak and adobo. Adam reveals his top pick for inexpensive blenders, and Ashley makes Julia the ultimate Texas breakfast taco. That's all right here on Cook's Country. You probably remember the Alamo, but have you ever heard of the Chili Queens? In 1836, during that famous battle, women and some men known as Chili Queens set up stands in Alamo Plaza and fed the soldiers spicy stews from big copper kettles. And after the railroads came to nearby San Antonio in 1877, tourists sought out the stands where a bowl of beans and chili plus a tortilla cost just a few cents. Now the Chili Queens served all kinds of Mexican fare and they were written about in near mythological style. According to a clip from the San Antonio Daily Express in 1894, the Chili Queens were ever attentive, always jolly, bright, bewitching creatures. Today, the Chili Queens are long gone, but we're here to carry on that tradition with a hearty, rich chili of flank steak and adobo. Now, the dish we're making today is actually called arrachera in adobo. I love a dish that I can roll my R's for. But basically, it's steak that's stewed in a chili-based sauce, and it's sweet, and it's a little bit spicy and smoky and a little bit fruity, too. And Julia's going to show us how to make it. That's right. And if you ask 10 different cooks how to make this dish, you'll get 12 to 13 different answers <laughs> because there's so many styles, and they're all delicious. But we homed in on the style we like the best, all right. which we think is more authentic. Okay. And it all starts with dried chilies. This is the the star of the show, anchos and pasillas. Now these aren't spicy, but the ancho is very sweet and raisiny. The pasilla is a little bitter and earthy, mm. so the combination is good. And to bring out their flavor, you really have to toast them in the oven. So before we toast in the oven, you want to get rid of the stem and the seeds. To get rid of the stem, sometimes you can pull it off and you want to cut in there. And that way you get all the seeds out. But we want to control the spice and the heat, so that's why we're going to take them out. In total, we have one and a half ounces of ancho and one ounce of pasilla. The seeds are almost glued on. Sticky. Yeah, that means it's going to have good yeah. flavor. All right, there's that one. Now, these are the pasilla. They're a little easier because they're really concentrated at the top of the chili. So I'm just going to, again, cut it open, pull out that pod of seeds. So here we have all of our chilies that have been stemmed and seeded. We're going to toast them in a 350 degree oven for about five minutes to really bring out their flavor. Sounds good. All right, so the chili is roasted in that oven for just five minutes. They're good and toasty and fragrant. It was a beautiful smell. <laughs> and now I put them in a big bowl with some warm tap water for five minutes. That's to soften them. Take them out of the water. A little water clinging to the chilies is totally okay. fine. There we go, right into a blender jar. A lot of the adobo sauces we tried included some tomatillos, and we really liked that fresh, fruity, light flavor. But even better, use tomatillo salsa. So this is 3 quarters of a cup of jarred tomatillo salsa. Next, a little chicken broth. This adds some good liquid. This is 3 quarters of a cup of chicken broth. Now, a little bit of orange juice, which you commonly find in some Mexican sauces. This is half a cup of orange juice. Lime juice, of course. This is a quarter of a cup of fresh lime juice. Just a little bit of sugar. It goes a long way. Okay. So a third of a cup of brown sugar. This is a teaspoon and a half of dried oregano. Last but not least, one teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoon of black pepper. In the blender, it goes. We're going to blend this until it's very smooth, and that can take up to two minutes. All right. All right, so that's been about two minutes. Give me a whiff of that. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah, you can see how nice and smooth and thick that mm -hmm. is. That's perfect. <laughs> All right, we're going to set this sauce aside for now and go on down here and talk about the meat. So flank steak is very traditional. This is a two and a half to three pound flank steak. Sometimes you find nice big guys like this. Sometimes you have to buy two little guys. But okay. First thing we're going to do, see if you need to trim any fat. This little bit of fat I'm not going to trim off. That's going to add good flavor. Good. Sometimes you get a lovely fat cap. Mm -hmm. That'd be a bit much. All right, so now I'm just going to cut it into one and a half inch pieces. You kind of just cut it in one direction, and then you cut it in the other, and you got nice big stew size pieces. And now I'm just going to spread these guys out, quick pat dry, and then we're going to season it with half a teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoon of pepper. Okay, there we go. And now I like to move the meat around, just catch up any of that seasoning that's been lost so it sticks to the meat, doesn't get left behind on the board. Like with most stews or braises, we're going to brown the meat. That gives a nice fawn. It gives a nice depth of flavor yes. to the sauce. So over medium-high heat, I'm going to add just a tablespoon of oil. And I'm going to wait till that oil is nice and smoking before I add half the meat. 
All right, the oil is smoking. So now we're gonna add half the beef. We don't wanna crowd the pan, because we want it to brown really nicely and get that good fond. So we're gonna brown it for six to nine minutes till it's good and golden on all sides. So we're gonna set it aside and brown that second batch. Sounds good. All right, so this second batch of beef is ready to come out. Tons of color, tons oh, of flavor. Oh yeah, that's a good looking pot right there. <laughs> So there's a good amount of fat left in the pot that's perfect for sauteing up the aromatics. Okay. I'm gonna turn the heat down to medium and add one chopped onion. And to that I'm gonna add half a teaspoon of salt. And this will take about three to five minutes to soften and get lightly browned. All right. So it's been about five minutes and you can see those onions have gotten smaller, they've shrunk, and they got nice and brown. Now time to add some garlic. This is a whopping eight cloves. Woohoo! Yeah. And we're also gonna add a tablespoon of ground cumin. We're just gonna cook this for about 30 seconds until, yeah, you can oh, smell it. You can really smell it. Oh, now it's turning into a good chili. Time for the adobo sauce. Thank you. So right into the hot pot out of the blender. I'm gonna use this little spatula to make sure I get it all in there. There, there we go. All right, I'm gonna stir this in. You can see how it looks thick. It's not gonna reduce too much thicker consistency in the oven because so much moisture is gonna come right. out of the steak. So in goes the browned flank steak and any juices that have accumulated while it was sitting. Oh, and that's it. Bring this to a simmer. I can see it simmering right there around oh. the edges. And now we're gonna cook it in the oven, which again, we love doing with braises because the heat's more even and you don't get hot spots or scorched spots on the bottom of the pot. That's right. So I'm gonna cover it and I'm gonna put it in the oven for about an hour and a half until that flank steak is tender. Sounds good. I'll get the door for you. Oh, thank you. All right, so while that adobo is in the oven, we're gonna make some tortillas. So it starts with flour. This is two cups of all-purpose flour. To this, we're gonna add one and a quarter teaspoons of salt. We're just gonna whisk this together. Now we're going to add the shortening or lard, and I have five tablespoons here. So I'm just pinching the lard between my fingers and working it into the flour. And we're just looking for it to be evenly incorporated. Don't want any big pieces of lard. You can see the texture has really changed. It just looks like coarse crumbs mixed in there and that's what you're looking for. So to this, we're just gonna add some water. We found using warm water makes it a little easier for the dough to come together. This is two thirds of a cup of warm water. Now I'm gonna use a spoon. I'm just gonna get this dough to come together in the bowl. Now that the dough's come together, I'm just gonna use my hands and knead it still in the bowl to try to get up any of those little floury bits, try to get them incorporated. The other trick I do is you can turn it onto the board, flatten it out and put the scrappy bits right in the center, and then you sort of knead them in. And as I knead it, I'm just gonna scrape up any bits that are on the counter and knead them right in. Knead this for a little bit till it makes a nice smooth ball. That means the gluten's been developed, make a nice chewy tortilla. All right, so that looks good. Beautiful. I'm gonna cut it into 12 even pieces. That represents 12 tortillas. Bench scraper is great for doing this. I'm just gonna eye it. And now, the fun part, wanna join me? Yes. Make it a ball. All right. So you can do it in your hands. You can also do it right on the counter. You're letting the dough really stick to the board. And that makes a nice, perfect ball. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we just really worked the gluten in these things. They're gonna need to relax for about 30 minutes before we can roll them out. Yeah, me too. Into, <laughs> into a good flat tortilla. So I'm just gonna cover them with plastic wrap so they don't dry out. That takes about half an hour. We're gonna let them rest in the refrigerator. You can smell the flavor coming out of the oven. Sure can. Oh, all right. Ready? I am. Voila. Look at that color, it's oh. so deep and dark in there. Oh. It smells so good, you smell the chilies, yes. you smell the onion, yes. a little cumin. Yes. So this is ripping hot, so we're gonna let it cool, obviously before we eat it. But I'm gonna show you how to test for doneness. One way is you pick up a piece of meat, you put the fork on it, and you can see how much resistance there is. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. We're gonna let this lava hot adobo cool for a little bit while we make some tortillas. All right, work for my supper. All right, so we have two boards set up here. A little bit of flour on our work surface here and grab a dough ball. And now we're just gonna use a rolling pin and roll it out to a six inch tortilla. And I like to start by using my hands, really just press it out while it's nice and easy to manipulate. And again, we're looking for about six inches. And more importantly, you really want them to be even so that they cook evenly in the pan. Gotcha. All right, and so now to store them, we're gonna put them on these little pieces of parchment paper that I've cut to six inch square. So that's right. kind of a good judge oh. as to how big 
It is, and we're just gonna stack them on a plate. Sounds good. There we go. A roundish tortilla. <laughs> all right, so we're just gonna finish these up and then we're gonna cook them off. All right. So cooking these is really easy and non-stick pan is good because it won't stick. How about that? How about that? I greased it just a little bit with some vegetable oil and I put it in there, medium high heat. You can see it's starting to bubble. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's doing that. Flip it over. Oh, that little bit of golden browning. It's perfect. All right. I'm gonna cook that on the second side. It's about a minute each side. You're cooking them one at a time, but they go super fast. They do. All right, so it's been about a minute on that second side. Oh, you can see some nice browning. Mm -hmm. It's puffing. That's cooking the inside. If you don't let it puff, the inside stays a little too raw. That's right. All right, and this is a tortilla warmer. It's great for keeping those tortillas nice and warm for serving. That looks good on both sides. Right into the tortilla warmer. That's our last guy. Oh, goodness. So good. Oh. Give you a little extra sauce. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's not just flank steak, I want in adobo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so here we're gonna have a little bit of queso fresco. Beautiful. And of course, just a little cilantro. This is beautiful. Are you jealous mm -hmm. of me right now? I'm about mm -hmm. to tuck in, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. look at that meat. It's falling apart. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, it wouldn't be the same without homemade tortillas. Mm -hmm. Really are worth it. But the flavor of that sauce, it's nice and thick and smooth. It's not too sweet, it's not too acidic, and you can really taste the chilies. No, it's true. Really well balanced. That's that nice fruity kick too. That's yep. those ancho chilies. Well, this amazing dish, it all starts with a rich adobo sauce. Toast ancho and pasilla chilies in the oven, soften in water, then blend with salsa verde, orange juice, spices, and more. Sear flank steak, and then cook onions along with garlic and cumin. Add the beef and sauce back to the pot and cook it all until tender. Meanwhile, make tortilla dough with flour, shortening, and water. Then grab a friend to help roll out and cook the tortillas. Serve it all with queso fresco and cilantro. So from Cook's Country and a couple of chili queens, <laughs> it's flank steak in adobo. Dr. Jonas Salk used one during his development of the polio vaccine. And we use it to make frozen margaritas. It's the blender. And Adam's here to tell us more. <laughs> you know, we have tested expensive blenders in the past, but we wanted to find out what $100 would buy us hmm. in the world of blenderdom. So we have seven different blenders here. Price cap of $100. Low price was about $60. They're all from popular manufacturers. And let me tell you about the tests. OK. They did not include a polio vaccine. <laughs> But they did include margaritas. There you go. And kale smoothies, and making mayonnaise, and pureeing tomato soup, and crushing ice. Basics that you would expect out of a good blender. Exactly. Now, there was a lot of variation in terms of the performance. A lot of that had to do with the design of the jar. When you're blending food, you're forming a vortex, which is like a little tornado inside of that jar. So the food gets whipped up, pulled back down onto the blades. That's what makes for efficient blending. Okay. The diameter of the jar has a lot to do with that. This one was about the biggest diameter we had. It was yeah, about five wide. and a half inches. And that means that the food gets splattered onto the edges. And unless you stop and scrape it down, it doesn't have optimal contact with the blades. Much better was this guy here. This is about four and a half inches across the middle. The food doesn't go as far out. You get a tighter vortex, smoother smoothies, smoother <laughs> soup, better crushed ice. And don't forget the margaritas. Don't forget the margaritas. Only three of these blenders did all right on the mayonnaise test. Mayonnaise is a mm. little tricky because the eggs and the oil have to be emulsified at a fairly slow, even pace. Testers used a tachometer to measure how quickly the blades spin in RPMs or revolutions per minute. A lot of these guys just spun way too fast, even at the lowest speed, really? close to 10,000 to 14,000 RPMs. The machines that did a better job with the mayonnaise spun more like 8,500 RPMs at the lowest speed. The second factor in terms of the mayonnaise test was the position of the blade relative to the bottom of the jar. In this one, for instance, the blade sat too high, so the eggs and the oil got trapped underneath without really contacting the blade or mixing in. Okay. Testers also paid attention to the usability and design. They wanted clear controls. They wanted nice light jars that were easy to attach to the blender, detach from the blender, easy to pour from. They paid a lot of attention to noise. I want you to give this one a try. This red one? Yeah. All right. Mm. 
Can you imagine making a smoothie in the morning with that? <laughs> I'm awake. <laughs> and all the neighbors know it too, Seriously. down the street. It sounds like you're going into a dentist office. Yeah, in an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Testers use a decibel meter. This is one of the loudest blenders. I believe and it. that was not a selling point. No. The, uh, the winning blender was a lot quieter. The last thing that testers tried was cleaning them. And to find out whether they retained stains or odor, testers pureed chipotle peppers and raw garlic, <laughs> let it sit around for a while, cleaned it out of the jars, and then did the old sniff test. And? The good news is that the winning blender did not retain odors. Very good news. And in fact, this is the winning blender. This is the Black & Decker Performance Fusion Blade. It's about $80.26. It had the narrowest jar of all of them, about 4.25 inches across the middle. Clear, easy to use controls. It did almost as well as a lot of the higher priced blenders and it was nice and quiet. It didn't keep any odors or stains. This is a fine blender for less than a hundred bucks. Well, there you go. For less than a hundred bucks, you can get a great blender and it's the Black & Decker Performance Fusion Blade Blender for $80.26. Down in San Antonio, they are crazy for breakfast tacos. And the thing that distinguishes a breakfast taco from one that you'd eat for dinner is that you eat it in the morning. Now, sometimes they're filled with breakfast foods like eggs or sausage, but oftentimes you can find them filled with traditional meat fillings like you would eat for dinner. And they're a delicious way to start the day. And today, Ashley's going to show us how to make them at home. That's right, I am. Now, people in San Antonio are so crazy about tacos <laughs> that they even sell them at the gas station. <laughs> That's a little crazy. Right. So <laughs> let's get started. I'm going to show you first the salsa roja, which is the red sauce. Start by stemming one Roma tomato, and I'm going to core the center of it out here. And now chop this here, and we have one pound total of the tomatoes. Add two cloves of chopped garlic, stir it until combined. And now I'm going to microwave these tomatoes for about four minutes. We want to remove excess liquid so that the salsa won't be too thick. So the tomatoes are going to start to steam, and the liquid begins to pool at the bottom of the bowl. Four minutes later, and let's take a look at all of that liquid. That's a lot of liquid. And now I am going to add these tomatoes to this blender here. To this, I'm going to add one jalapeno that I have seeded and chopped, and two tablespoons of cilantro, mm. one tablespoon of lime juice, one teaspoon of salt, and just for some controlled heat, a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Just gonna process this until smooth, which will take about 45 seconds. Let's take a look. Take a little whiff of that. Ooh, that smells good. You can really smell the jalapeno and the cilantro coming through. Mm -hmm. Much better, too, than just opening up a jar of salsa. Mm -hmm. And I like the texture. It's nice and thick, so it'll stick to the taco. No t-shirt dripping. <laughs> Promise. OK, let's take a walk on over to the stove. Now we're going to start focusing on the filling of our breakfast tacos. And the first thing we're going to do is cook eight ounces of chorizo. Now, chorizo is Mexican-style sausage. It's not cooked, so you do have to cook it. So I'm going to add that chorizo over medium heat. And if you notice, I took the casings off of the chorizo. And I'm just going to cook this until well browned all over, which will take about six to eight minutes. It's been eight minutes, and this chorizo is looking beautiful. It looks awesome. It smells good, too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to build the filling. So this is one small onion that is finely minced. And here we have one more jalapeno that I also took the seeds out of and chopped. Cook these for about four to six minutes until the vegetables are just softened. While these are cooking, let's step over here. Hey, and eggs. Eggs. <laughs> it's breakfast time. Let's have some eggs. So if you notice, we have quite a bit of eggs in here. This is 12 large eggs. A whole carton. A whole carton. And I'm going to add a half a teaspoon salt and a quarter teaspoon pepper. And I'm going to whisk these until the mixture is completely yellow, and that's going to take about one whole minute. OK? Looks beautiful to me. Looks good and even. Let's get scrambling. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to add these eggs to the skillet. Now, you still have the heat over medium heat. Yes, low and slow for these scrambled eggs. And if you notice, I switched to a rubber spatula. I did notice. Yes. 
I'm going to continually move these eggs around the skillet until they start to clump, mm -hmm. and until the rubber spatula, when I drag it through the center, leaves a nice clear lane. That's how I know they're almost cooked, but not totally. And that's gonna take about one and a half to two and a half minutes. Okay. Now there is a range in there because depending on the skillet and the pan you use, they all have different dimensions in the bottom. Ain't that so, the truth. Exactly. <laughs> So it's really important to pay attention to the visual cues as opposed to just the time range or heat level in this recipe. Okay. Ooh, I'm starting to see a trail. Yes, the eggs are on their way to being cooked. Now, if you notice, they still look pretty wet. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be an additional just 30 to 60 seconds. Reduce the heat to low, and I'm going to cook them, just moving them ever so slightly until they start to clump more, but they're gonna still look wet. A lot okay. of times we cook eggs oh. so much to the point where they look so dry because they're overcooked. Mm -hmm. Nothing worse than a dry egg. Exactly. So here, they're almost close. I'd say we have about 10 seconds left. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you see, it That's looks good. still slightly wet. So let's stop cooking these eggs and let's eat. I like it. Okay. So I'm gonna slide this over. So in that tortilla warmer, <laughs> we have some homemade flour tortillas. Ooh, and these homemade flour tortillas are awesome. Ooh, I love the rustic edge oh, of a good yeah. homemade tortilla. Mm -hmm. For the toppings, we have the salsa that we made earlier. Looks so good. Mm -hmm. Some shredded Monterey Jack cheese. I love when you get the cheese on a hot dog, oh, when it just goodness. starts to melt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sliced scallions and some lime wedges. Mm, my favorite flavors. Mm -hmm. All right. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Man, mm -hmm. so good. The so chorizo good. is really flavorful with the eggs. I like the little bit of onion and quite a kick of jalapeno, which yeah. I dig. But not too much. And I love the texture of the eggs. They're yeah. nice and moist. They're not dry and rubbery. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that flour tortilla. Ashley, thank you. These are awesome. Oh, thank <laughs> New you. New favorite. So to make your own Texas style morning, start by making a salsa roja using fresh tomatoes that you microwave, drain, then blend until smooth. For the tacos, make a flavorful egg scramble starting with chorizo, onion, and jalapeno. Once the eggs are added to the pan, cook them for about two minutes on medium and turn the heat down to low to finish. Serve with a homemade flour tortilla and you're raring to go. You can find this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, cookscountry.com. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>